Okay, welcome everybody uh, to today's National Housed Campaign Call. I'm Paul Keeley. I'm the Chief Operating Officer at the National Low Income Housing Coalition. We have a great call set up for you today. Uh, we'll be joined by Senator Maisie Hirono from Hawaii. Uh, we'll talk about the need for affordable housing investments and in the upcoming infrastructure package. We'll also hear the latest on emergency rental assistance programs around the country. Uh, about a new executive director expanding access to legal representation, the latest from Capitol Hill and from the field and a lot more. Um, I want to encourage everybody as um, I always do to please use the Q&A <clears throat> at the bottom of your screen for any questions that you might have and uh, use the chat for communicating with others on the call about anything you want to communicate about. But I'll mainly focus on the Q&A um, for, uh, for questions and, and answers. Before we begin, I also really want to urge all of you, <clears throat> if your organization has not yet signed on to a letter supporting the housed campaign priorities for universal, stable, and affordable housing, please do that um, today. Um, I'll drop in the box the link for you to sign on, and I'll also drop into the into the, the chat the, uh, a place where you can go if you want to see if your organization has already signed on or not, because um, perhaps you already already signed on. So let me just uh, quickly drop that into the chat. Oh, okay, somebody has already done that. I'll do it again, and there's a place here where you can see if you've uh, already signed on or not. Um, okay, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Let me just, there we go. Um, <clears throat> and it is a, a real honor and a pleasure to um, introduce Senator Maisie Hirono, Democrat, Democrat from Hawaii. Senator Hirono has made history as the first Asian American woman and the first woman senator from Hawaii. Throughout her career, Senator Hirono has been a steadfast champion for struggling families, advocating for affordable housing, education, access to health care and food security, among other critical issues. She led her colleagues in introducing the Pathway to Stable and Affordable Housing for All Act, a bill that she worked with NLIC to craft which would effectively end homelessness and housing poverty in the United States by expanding rental assistance to every eligible household, investing $40 billion annually in the National Housing Trust Fund and providing significant funding for other key programs. Uh, before I, I turn it over to Senator Hirono, I just also really encourage you, if you haven't already, check out the Senator's bio uh, which is unbelievably inspiring on her website. I'll, I'll put the, the link to that in the chat as well. Uh, what a phenomenal story it is, and, and it's a real honor to have her uh, with us today. So I will turn it over to you, Senator Hirono. Thank you for being with us. Thank you so much, Paul. And you pretty much went over the areas of focus for the coalition. So. Uh, my thanks to all of you who are on this call and the, and the hundreds who are um, also connecting because what could be uh, so critical as to provide housing universally to everyone in our country. And this pandemic has uh, once again pointed out the disparities in housing, affordable housing availability to uh, too many people in our country. And so uh, in Hawaii, of course, we've always had an affordable housing issue. And, and so th these are areas of concern that are not new to me or obviously to all of you. Thank you also, Paul, for mentioning the bill that I plan to introduce once again, Pathway to State, uh, to Stable and Affordable Housing for All Act. And my hope is that we can get the, the provisions that relate to providing affordable housing uh, in the infrastructure bill. 
We'll do our best to get that infrastructure bill passed because that is a job creation bill. But of course, the other aspect of the of what I call the infrastructure approach is that there's also the care economy that is also part of our infrastructure. And that has a lot to do with the, the um, uh, housing needs that address both of these, uh, these areas. So we just have to continue to be advocates. I think that there is, as, as I said, an opportunity for us to get an infrastructure bill through. One hopes with the Republican support. I must say they haven't been exactly enthusiastically forthcoming in their position regarding the infrastructure bill. They have a pretty narrow uh, view of what we should be funding through the, the both aspects of the Getting America Back on Track uh, approach. So the the all of the things that you have been supporting all these years. Thank you very much. I will continue to, con my advocacy, and, I, and we know that we have a tremendous supporter in Sherrod Brown, for example. Uh, much of this kind of legislation, I think, with regard to uh, providing affordable housing will go to the, the banking committee, I think, or it may go to finance, where we also have a strong supporter in, uh, and, and uh, Ron Wyland, and, and, and of course, Patty Murray has always been a huge supporter. The fact that uh, Democrats are now setting the agenda in the Senate makes a very big difference in the kind of bills that will even come to the floor of the Senate for votes. Now, that's one thing. We set the agenda, but with a 50-50 split, it gets very challenging to uh, make sure that we have the votes needed. And any measure that will require 60 votes will be uh, that much more challenging. This may be an, another area where we're going to need to resort to, um, to uh, using the reconciliation process to get something massively important done. So this is where we are. Thank you very much for seeing the course. As my mother taught me, <laughs> Life lessons. One person can make a, make a difference. And since all of you are working together, we can make a difference. My mom changed my life by bringing me to this country. Second li life lesson is uh, half, the, half the battle is showing up. You have showed up for this course, but it's not just physically showing up, but it is uh, just staying the course. Half the battle is staying the course, being very determined and focused. And the third is getting out of our comfort zone. Uh, and that's what you all are doing by advocating for the kinds of uh, things that we need to do to, to help our individuals and uh, families in our communities who are in dire need of affordable housing. As we say in Hawaii, mahalo nui loa, everyone. Take care, stay safe, be kind. Aloha. Thank you so much, Senator Rona. Do you have, do you have time for maybe a couple questions? I think so. I. Okay. I'm getting a sign from my staff that I <laughs> sure. I, I just wondered if you could give us any uh, perspective at this point, and and maybe you have to be cautious about what you say about it in terms of the the process where we are now, in terms of trying to achieve something uh, that's bipartisan. Do you foresee a possibility where the the infrastructure package, which is big and bold, that uh, President Biden has put forward? might get split up into something that could be done on a bipartisan basis, followed up by something that would have to be done through reconciliation. We're very concerned, obviously, as, as uh, housing advocates that the housing portion of the Biden proposal, which is really robust and, and fantastic, um, you know, could get split up. And are there any risks to doing that in terms of, of then getting <clears throat> maybe the more moderate um, Democrats on board with the reconciliation part of that? Well, for one thing, th there, there is an infrastructure, what I would call the traditional infrastructure uh, that the Republicans uh, look at. And their proposal is, uh, even as to the traditional infrastructure, the roads, the bridges, all, all of that, uh, that is uh, so small <laughs> compared to the need that is there. Every state has huge infrastructure needs. So their proposal is uh, in the order of 700 or 500 to 700 billion. And a large part of that is already uh, funding that's already been accounted for. So that's not the kind of bold infrastructure proposals that we need. 
So there's a already within what I would call the traditional infrastructure, there's a big gulf between what the Republicans and what the Democrats and what uh, President Biden is proposing. So there's that. And yes, I think there might be efforts to try and bifurcate uh, what I call the, the infrastructure needs, including the, the support that we need for rental housing assistance and, and uh, uh, all of that. So I am, uh, my hope is that we will not start to split things up because every time you split things up, that means that the stuff that's left behind never gets addressed. So there's always that fear. The way things are going, I, I one remains always hopeful that we can do something in a bipartisan way. However, I feel a sense of urgency to get these things done. And that sense of urgency means that we're not gonna spend a whole year negotiating with the Republicans uh, on a bill that's not gonna even go um, very far to meet the need. I think that we should make up our minds. And as far as I'm concerned, unless we do filibuster reform, which I also support, but even the uh, Democrats are not all united on the need to in my opinion, eliminate the filibuster, then we are going to need to resort to uh, to the, the reconciliation process. And um, the question remains as to how long are we going to continue to negotiate in good faith? And at some point, <laughs> we're gonna need to say, this isn't gonna work. We haven't reached that point yet. Obviously we're still <laughs> in discussions. Thank you, Senator Hirono. Um, another question is, just, you know, there are hundreds of people on this call and, and many others that we interact with all the time. Um, and they are advocates for housing for people with the greatest needs, people with the lowest incomes. Mm -hmm. What advice do you have for people on this call? What do you recommend that they do to really ensure that whatever infrastructure package does get passed, you know, includes housing for people with the greatest needs? I think you're already doing that because you have come together. You are a coalition and you have been doing this for quite a while. You are all advocates. I know you know who to call. And as I said, though, with the Democrats in charge, so to speak, we may not have quite the votes that we would like to have with 50-50 split. But the, the chairs of the various committees are very much, I think, on your page uh, in terms of kind of support. So continuing to... Uh, make contact with them to, uh, to ask them to be sure to have these kinds of provisions. And any Republicans that you can influence uh, by calling them, et cetera, I, you know, I, I know that you are, this coalition is very strategic in what you need to do. And so some of the traditional things that you've been doing, keep doing it. And maybe there are more things that you can be creative about doing in your advocacy. Thank you so much, Senator Hirono, for joining us for this call, for Thank all you. of your work, for um, your, your advancing these priorities, for being really a leader uh, in, in getting the things that the House campaign is, is calling for. It's all in your bill. <laughs> so uh, thank you so, so much for being a leader on this front. And thank you so much for joining us on today. Well, mahalo, Paul, and to everyone on this call. All right, take mahalo. care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Okay, we will um, <clears throat> move on to the next item on our agenda, <clears throat> which is an update on emergency rental assistance programs uh, will be provided to you from uh, research analyst Neetu Nair and um, research analyst uh, Emma Foley, uh, both from the National Low Income Housing Coalition, and they have lots to share. So I'll turn it over to Neetu and Emma. Thanks, Paul. And hi, everyone. Thank you for joining the call today. Uh, my colleague Emma Foley and I will be providing some updates with the latest um, with emergency rental assistance programs. So if you've been following our calls, um, last week we announced the launch of our modified rental assistance database. Um, it now features and highlights the Treasury ERA programs in a much more accessible and easy to search format. Um, so programs that serve multiple jurisdictions are sort of cross-referenced, so renters and landlords looking for assistance can really quickly identify programs serving their areas. 
these resources can be accessed on the same rental assistance page on our website. And I'm just dropping the, the link uh, in the chat here as well. Our rental assistance page also gives access to our larger database, which includes now nearly a thousand programs, over 370 of which are from the Treasury Emergency Rental Assistance Program. In total, we know that um, around 740 total jurisdictions receive direct allocations from Treasury. So we'll be monitoring these um, jurisdictions closely to see um, if their programs are up and running and reflect those, um, reflect those programs in our database. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. So last week we, um, Last week, we also launched our ERA database, and I'm going to provide some updates on where we currently stand with the new Treasury ERA programs. We have um, 374 programs that are representing 65% of all the state, local, and tribal governments that received direct allocations from Treasury. Of the 374 programs in our database, we have 50 states, including DC. 228 city and county programs and 96 territory or tribal government programs with more to be added in the coming weeks. Um, and over 90% of the programs on our database are currently accepting applications. Um, we've recorded 49 state programs that are open with uh, New York and North Dakota um, with an estimated um, opening dates sometime in the next um, couple of days by the end of the month. Um, and uh, we also have um, two, uh, around, um, sorry, my computer just glitched. I'm so sorry for that uh, pause. So 90% of the programs are now um, accepting applications and we'll continue to track and update these uh, public facing documents three times a week on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so these are some of the key issues that we're currently tracking, uh, which includes self-attestation, um, direct tenant assistance, and also um, monitoring programs that are serving tenants with federal, receiving federal rent subsidies. And some things that we're um, going to be tracking soon are tracking what other sorts of housing services are provided and covered under ERA programs, such as relocation expenses, um, whether programs are covering late fees, covering um, hotel motel stays and others. And soon we're going to be uh, also be tracking statewide spending of ERA programs. Um, and we should have updates on that um, within within the next three to four weeks. Next slide, please. Um, so our latest ERA dashboard uh, provides information of key features of program design and implementation that enable them to serve the lowest income and most marginalized renters in need of housing assistance. Um, and this, uh, some of the indicators that we have on our dashboard include um, the trends that we've been noticing with self-attestation um, and direct tenant assistance. Um, as we currently stand, um, only 42% of the programs that we, uh, we track have explicitly said that they provide self-attestation as an option to reduce documentation burden. Um, COVID hardship remains the most commonly seen um, allowable feature for self-attestation, uh, but it's still only 30% of the program, of all programs that allow self-attestation that still provide COVID hardship attestation. The latest treasury guidance strongly encourages strongly encourages flexible program design so that grantees may extend the emergency rental assistance to vulnerable populations without imposing undue documentation burdens. Um, so we'll be constantly monitoring this to see if programs are um, changing or, or modifying their guidelines to include more self-attestation options. Uh, similar, with, uh, similar to that, we also track how um, if households are 
if programs are serving households that receive federal rent subsidies. And so far we've recorded only 34% of our programs explicitly allow um, tenants who do receive federal rent subsidies to be eligible for ERA as well. And finally with direct tenant, um, 87 programs, or that's only 23% of all the programs we have recorded explicitly say that they provide relief directly to tenants. And once again, these uh, numbers will constantly uh, be updated as we find more information on these programs. I'm going to now turn it over to my colleague, Emma, who will be talking about a new resource that NLIHC has developed um, to provide uh, more guidance for programs looking to modify their um, modify their program design based on the new treasury guidance. Thanks so much, me too. Um, so yes, we recently uh, launched an ERA resource hub last week, which features various resources from programs nationwide. The link is included at the top of this slide, and I also just dropped it in the chat. And the purpose of this hub is to facilitate resource sharing by offering tools and customizable examples for program administrators and advocates. Information for the resource hub was collected from our state and local partners and from program web pages from our in-depth emergency rental assistance tracking. The hub includes program forms, applications, procedures, reports, and other materials to serve as adaptable examples. The hub includes ERA program documents grouped into several different categories, including things like self-attestation forms, direct to tenant, and evaluation reports. Each document within the hub is labeled with the program location and the relevant hyperlink. We will be updating the hub regularly to add new categories and to add new resources to existing categories. And one thing to note about the resource hub more generally is that while it offers a variety of examples, ERA grantees and their partners will really have the best knowledge of which examples will best fit their needs on the ground. Next slide, please. So the hub currently includes resources related to the categories listed here. So these include self-attestation forms for applicants to attest to their income, place of residency, whether they are experiencing a COVID hardship or experiencing housing instability. The second is direct to tenant forms. The third is prioritization information, including the kinds of methods that programs are using to get funding to applicants most in need. The fourth is program applications for both tenant and landlords, as well as the fifth, which is real-time data dashboards. And these can help facilitate program transparency and also help programs make mid-course corrections when challenges arise. The sixth is evaluation reports. And finally, the last is outreach materials, which includes things like social media toolkits, radio and video ads, and program flyers. The hub also has a category of emergency rental assistance research and reports that have been authored or co-authored by NLIHC. These reports include more in-depth information on things like prioritization and rental assistance programs, advancing racial equity within these programs, and other best practices identified through our research, including interviews and surveys with program administrators and their partners. The Hub is an ongoing work in progress that we will continue to update and revise weekly. And so if you have any feedback on the content of the Hub or other categories that might be useful, please feel free to email me at the email address listed on the slide. Additionally, if you know of a program that has materials that could be useful to share more widely, please do send those as well. And that's all I have for now. I'll turn it back to Paul. Great, thank you both, uh, Nitu and Emma. Um, there are a few questions I, I'd just like to, to share and see if you have answers to them. Are there resources available to learn about the software um, vendors who are successfully working to help administer ERA programs? You guys know of? That's a great question. I'm not sure resources specifically that have kind of aggregated this. I think ones that we see often are neighborly and Salesforce in terms of software. 
um, but it definitely depends on, you know, the size of the program and kind of the capacity um, and funds they have for that uh, type of administration. But this is a question we've gotten a couple of times, I think in like the last week or so. And so this might be something that we wanna add to the resource hub or have a state local call on. Great. There are two kind of related questions here. And um, I don't know if this is more for uh, Nitu and, and what you presented. Do you, do you uh, rate ERA programs by success rate or otherwise? Uh, success rate, meaning distribution of funds, processing time, et cetera. And is there a way to access data indicating how much funds have already been distributed by a local administrator? Thanks, Paul. That's a great question. Um, and we, uh, so we are definitely going to start tracking um, how much programs are spending down on the state level. So we're going to be starting statewide spending tracking um, to see how effective state programs have been in getting the money out the door quickly to those who need it the most. Um, we don't we don't typically rate these programs because there are so many different aspects to determine um, how successful a program has been, but we do record um, different attributes that programs could um, sort of enforce in their program design to effectively serve the most marginalized populations in their communities. Um, and that information is available on the ERA dashboard um, as well as on the resource hub. So the three, uh, so the rental assistance page, the ERA dashboard and the resource hub sort of um, complement each other in serving that larger picture of how effective programs have been. Great. Another question from Sarah Hasmer is, do you track photo ID requirements? That's a good question. We don't track photo ID specifically. I think most programs require some form of identification, which is why we didn't uh, choose to track that one systematically. Um, so the short answer would be that's not included in our in-depth tracking. There's a question that, that might be a little bit loaded, but I'll, I'll uh, maybe restate it a little bit. Um, this person asked, if you had to pick one state that's really fallen down or dropped the ball, what state comes to mind or state or states come to mind? I guess generally, you know, are there, are there states where, we, you know, we are saying, gee, we really think they have a lot, a long way to go in terms of improving how they're processing ERA applications and payments? Mm, that is a, a, a loaded question, but it is a fair question considering it's five months out of um, since since the money has had been allocated. Um, we're a little bit concerned with um, just because New York's program hasn't opened yet. So we're hoping that once they do get their program up and running, they're able to process all those applications really quickly. Um, but again, we know that it got held, we, we know the program got held up in um, some legislative issues. Um, but I think it is a, still a little bit too early to tell how um, effective state, states have been. Um, and hopefully once we do start tracking that um, spending amount, we'll be able to have a more clear answer on that. And I don't know if there's the, anything Emma wanted to add. I guess I would just add to that before Emma responds, you know, and if there are some states where you really say, you know, here, here are a few that we think are the best programs that really seem to be working very, very effectively. Can you share that? Yeah, I think in terms of the best programs, um, there are a few that we can tell just through their real-time data dashboards that have spent around 10% of their funding so far. Um, these include places like Alaska, which I think is maybe now around 13% of their funding as well as a few other states. I don't want to try to list them off the top of my head and get them wrong, um, but we can definitely circle back on that on the next call. Um, but it is, I think, still a, a little early to say for sure, but we'll definitely keep tracking that with our state spending tracking that Nitu mentioned. Okay, well, there are other uh, questions in here, and if you have time to answer them uh, while you're on the call, that'd be great. I, I will ask one more. Uh, 
do you track whether programs request social security numbers? We see this as a, having a chilling effect, even where applicants are told they don't have to provide uh, uh, SSN. We, we unmuted at the same time. I'll say we track it in a, um, we have a, a tenant eligibility column in our in-depth database where we uh, track social security numbers as we see them. Um, and we also have a column related to whether programs explicitly uh, accept or deny applications based on citizenship status. Yeah, Emma covered it. I um, and I can drop the link to the larger database that has that information in the chat. That would be great. I would just say we should be seeing a pretty significant increase in the programs that, and right now it's a very small number, that are providing direct to tenant assistance now that Treasury has said this is something required for ERA2. So we should be seeing that grow really pretty dramatically, hopefully soon, right? That is the hope, and that's what we're hoping to see with um, with the um, ERA dashboard and the constant updates. Um, I think we already are seeing uh, that number slowly start to increase, um, and we're hoping that happens um, a lot more in the coming weeks. Great. Again, thank you to everybody for all the questions. We don't have, we didn't have time to get uh, to them. <clears throat> um, all of them today, but they are valuable to us because it helps inform what we do and what we'll share on future calls. And I just really want to thank Emma and Nitu for an excellent presentation and really for all of their work, uh, outstanding work. Thank you guys. Thanks, Paul. Thank you. Okay, we will now move on to the next item on our agenda. And we have with us Sandra Park, Senior Staff Attorney with ACLU Women's Rights Project, who's gonna talk about executive action related to expanding access to legal aid. Sandra, take it away. Hi everyone, it's great to be here with you all. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the Presidential Memorandum uh, that came out last week on access to justice. I thought I might start off with a bit of background uh, in terms of what has happened um, under the Obama-Biden administration on access to justice because this latest memorandum is really trying to build on that. Uh, so back in 2010, for the first time, DOJ launched an access to justice initiative, uh, and that was formally established into an office for access to justice in 2016. Um, and the purpose of the office was really to work with other parts of DOJ, as well as the federal government, uh, to coordinate different policy initiatives on topics um, that would include things like criminal defense, uh, enforcement of um, fines and fees by courts, uh, language barrier access to the courts, uh, as well as civil legal aid. Uh, and so one of the big things that the um, office did was launch and staff a White House Legal Aid Interagency Roundtable. Um, and that Legal Aid Interagency Roundtable was really focused on working with civil legal aid partners to advance federal programs and to analyze and create and disseminate tools um, to provide information about civil legal aid as well as federal funding opportunities. Uh, and that Legal Aid Interagency Roundtable became a White House initiative in 2015. Um, and part of what it did was really convene uh, different stakeholders around topics, um, looking at different solutions for access to justice. Uh, things like the medical legal partnerships um, we've seen in some communities that have gotten developed, as well as better procedures um, and court hearings for pro se parties. Uh, there were a number of other initiatives that came out of the Access to Justice um, office. Uh, and then in 2018, um, with a new administration that was closed down. And um, with uh, the Biden-Harris team coming in, there was advocacy from a number of groups to reopen and reestablish the office. Um, and uh, there was a letter from some of those groups, including the ACLU back in December, urging for the reopening of the office. 
And so uh, I think in partial response to that, we saw this May 18th presidential memorandum come out last week. Um, and the memorandum really reinforces the importance of increasing meaningful access to our legal system uh, as the foundation of equal justice under law. And it has two components. Um, so the first component is within 120 days, the memorandum calls on the Attorney General uh, in coordination with the Office of Management and Budget to submit a report to the President uh, describing a plan for DOJ to expand its access to justice function. Um, and, and the memo talks about um, how the report should include a discussion of the organizational placement of this access to justice work within DOJ, the expected staffing and budget, and any necessary timeline um, that would be, uh, that would need to govern notice to Congress if um, there needs to be any reorganization in terms of how this access to justice works happens within DOJ. Um, so that's one piece. And so it's a report essentially going to the president about how DOJ envisions um, its access to justice work being housed and resourced within the agency. The second part is um, reconvening the Legal Aid Interagency Roundtable as a White House initiative. Um, and there are several components that the memorandum lays out for what the LAIR is the acronym LAIR will do. Um, including improving coordination among federal programs so that programs are more efficient and produce better outcomes. And one way that could happen is including appropriate legal services among the range of supportive services that are provided through federal programs. Um, another, uh, another purpose would be around developing policy recommendations to improve access to justice um, at the federal, state, local, and tribal levels. Um, another purpose includes advancing relevant evidence-based research, data collection, and analysis of civil legal aid and indigent defense programs, um, and disseminating best practices. And there are, in terms of the membership of the layer, um, the Attorney General and Counsel to the President would serve as co-chairs, and the layer itself includes representatives from many different agencies. Um, and for those interested in housing, it includes, for example, HUD, Agriculture, HHS, and Treasury. Um, th the memorandum provides that LAIR will report to the President annually, and the first report will also be due in 120 days, so mid-September. Um, and that report will be focused on the impact of COVID-19 on access to justice in both criminal and civil legal systems. Um, so, you know, I think all of this is essentially re- um, starting of infrastructure for access to justice within DOJ and within the federal government overall. Um, and, you know, I think part of what we can do as an advocacy community is begin to think about how we might want to um, enlist the federal government and enlist this new structure around access to justice um, in our housing advocacy work moving forward. Um, so, you know, for example, I think there will be a lot of thinking and strategizing potentially about how to use our the access to justice um, work to, you know, look at issues arising out of eviction, um, including, you know, the process in eviction cases, as well as the long lasting impacts of eviction filings and records. Um, we could also think more about best practices in providing legal representation to tenants in eviction cases. Um, and another component that DOJ had done in the past is also um, submit interest, uh, statements of interest or amicus briefs in appropriate cases. Um, and so that's something else advocates could think about in terms of housing cases where uh, that might be uh, an appropriate role or where the US government's voice would be useful. So I think I'll stop there in terms of just describing the memorandum. And if there are any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Thank you so much, Sandra, for that excellent overview. I will just say we, uh, we, we did have an article about this in our Memo to Members and Partners e-newsletter today uh, with the link um, to the uh, executive action that Sandra discussed. And that is also, Kim, drop that into the chat box. So please check out Memo, uh, Memo to Members and Partners to, to read an overview of it and then to, to also see the link. Um, and, you know, right to counsel is 
uh, one of the key components of our uh, renter protections uh, piece of uh, priorities of the the, uh, the house campaign. So this, you know, this is something uh, we feel really, really strongly about, uh, particularly as as Sandra just said, in terms of how it's related to evictions and and other issues that legal issues that uh, that renters are facing, but so often do not have uh, legal representation. Um, so there is a question here from Michael Santos. Um, how do we get involved with the round table? Is that something that advocates could get involved or recommend who is involved, that kind of thing? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the round table, the members of the round table, it's really envisioned to be, um, you know, staff from across the federal government. Uh, but one of the charges um, that the uh, layer is supposed to um, do is, you know, really reach out to NGOs and other stakeholder partners. Um, and so I think that, uh, you know, likely Lair itself will create those opportunities, but, um, but NGOs can also think about, uh, you know, if there are specific ways that we want to engage with the Lair or issues that we want them to prioritize in terms of their work, um, doing that out active outreach on our end. Great. Well, thank you so much, Sandra, for this presentation. Really informative and for all of your great work. I uh, really appreciate your, uh, your leadership on this. So thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Okay. Great. We will uh, move on now to um, a, another colleague at the National Low Income Housing Coalition, Kim Johnson, policy analyst at NLIHC, who will talk a little bit about the American Rescue Plan Act uh, state and local fiscal recovery funds. Kim, take it away. Great, thank you, Paul, and hi, everyone. So my name is Kim Johnson. I'm a policy analyst at NLIHC, and I'm here today to flag a new source of American Rescue Plan Act funding that can be used for affordable housing. The American Rescue Plan Act provided $350 billion in state and local fiscal recovery funds to help states counties, cities, and tribal governments respond to the pandemic and its economic effects. State, local, and tribal governments can use these funds to provide emergency rental assistance or to address the housing and health needs of people experiencing homelessness. Treasury released on May 17th an interim final rule on implementation of fiscal recovery funds, which noted funds can be used to provide assistance to households, including rent, mortgage, or utility assistance, counseling and legal aid to prevent eviction or homelessness, cash assistance, food assistance, among other uses. Funds can also be used to prevent or mitigate the spread of COVID-19 in congregate living facilities, including ventilation improvements, supporting vulnerable populations access to medical care, and providing non-congregate spaces for isolation and quarantine. The interim final rule also provides flexibility for governments to use fiscal recovery funds to address the disparities that have contributed to the disproportionate impact of COVID-19 on marginalized communities through investments in housing and neighborhood development. Eligible uses include affordable housing development, housing vouchers, housing counseling, and housing navigation assistance to low-income households. These equity-minded provisions are primarily targeted to, targeted to qualified census tracts, tribal governments, and other disproportionately impacted areas. However, a number of advocates have raised concerns with this language and put forward important clarifying questions that need to be addressed by Treasury. Many rural areas don't have uh, many qualified census tracts, and the majority of low-income people don't necessarily live in a qualified census tract. Further clarification is also needed on how jurisdictions can make the case that a particular area has experienced a quote unquote disproportionate impact of COVID-19. So NLHC is working on a letter to Treasury with recommendations to ensure these issues are clearly addressed and that housing for extremely low income people is prioritized. As we draft this letter, we'd love to hear your thoughts hear your thoughts and thoughts from advocates about what's needed to ensure these funds are used to address inequities. If you have insights or thoughts you'd like to share, please reach out to me or Sarah Sadian. Um, my email is on the screen now. Um, and that is about it from me for now, Paul. Happy to try and answer any questions, but in the meantime, I will hand it back over to you. Great, Kim, thank you so much. And I will just say, you know, this additional money <clears throat> is 
a great opportunity. And so it's really important for advocates to be involved at the local level to help determine how these funds you know, they have some challenges, as Kim pointed out, in terms of uh, participating jurisdictions and so forth. But um, please, uh, you know, get involved at the local and state level um, to influence how these resources are, are used. And when we have our letter, and as Kim said, if you have any, guide, any input on the letter we'll be submitting to Treasury, please let us know, email Kim, provide her input. We'll be getting input from others on our state um, state and policy calls. Um, so, but please let us know and get involved in, in influencing where these resources go. Um, you mentioned that funds could be used for housing vouchers. Can it be used for a shallow subsidy program is one question that's that's uh, asked here, Kim. Ooh, I am not 100% sure. Um, that is something I will have to check in on. So whoever asked that, please feel free to reach out and we'll look into that. Okay. Um, and then there's a question here, is NLIC also reviewing allowable uses of the fund, not just geographical uh, areas that are eligible and or will, uh, be, will I guess, NLIC be able to give advocates some orientation about what kinds of advocacy we should be ready to, to launch at the state and local level? Um, hold on, sorry, I'm rereading that question. Um, yeah, so we can certainly take a look at the allowable uses of funds, especially if advocates are flagging that like there's a certain problem where there needs to be an expansion of the allowable uses. We can always make those suggestions to Treasury um, and or really give advocates some kind of orientation. Um, I mean, that's uh, something that we can certainly talk about with our field team to kind of plan some advocacy moves around how advocates at the state and local level can ensure that that funding is going to affordable housing. So that's definitely something that we can look into. Great, there's, there's one more question here about uh, if they define affordable housing development, uh, does that mean construction, rehab, et cetera? It, so I think that's one of the questions that we are going to need um, clarification from. From my understanding of reading the um, uh, guidance or the interim final rule, I guess, it it does count as you know construction as well as rehabilitation, um, but I think that's something that we need a little bit more clarity on. Okay, very good. Well, thank you so much, Kim, for that uh, that report, and we'll be back to you. I'll look forward to it. Bye. See you in a little while. Okay, we're going to move on now to um, our field updates, and uh, we have Emily Near, uh, case manager. Housing Law Unit at Legal Aid DC. Emily, you there? Hi, yeah, I'm here. Um, thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Um, so like the slide says, my name is Emily Neer. I am a case manager in the Housing Law Unit at Legal Aid Society of the District of Columbia. Um, I work with a number of clients um, and tenants who are seeking ERA funds, um, and I've been assisting them with the application process. Um, if we could go to the next slide, that'd be great. Um, so our um, ERA funded program is called Stronger Together by Assisting You or Stay DC. Um, the program launched um, and began taking applications on April 12th. Um, the primary application system is online, although there is a hotline available. There are no current in-person or paper application options. Um, and what we're seeing is that tenants really have to have access to internet, email, and or phone to apply. Um, what folks are experiencing um, often is that, you know, even if they are able to submit an application by uh, kind of going through a, the hotline, um, they do still need an email address to receive updates on their application status um, or to receive additional information about their application. Um, it's very, very difficult for folks who don't have access to internet, email, and really a computer. Um, the idea of navigating the site on the phone, on a phone seems really difficult. Um, the program's being administered by Deloitte. Um, they haven't really clearly included community-based organizations so far in the administration of STAY. Um, there has been some, I think, referrals made to community-based organizations um, who are um, assisting folks with getting through the application process, but their involvement is very limited. Um, tenants right now can receive up to 15 months of assistance with rent and utility assistance. We haven't seen a lot of outreach um, or campaigns made by our executive or the, the program to get tenants to apply. Um, and there is a housing provider application 
um, but landlords can't apply on behalf of tenants, the tenants still have to complete the entire tenant side of the application process independently in order to be considered for funds. Um, can we move to the next slide? Thank you. Um, so we're seeing a lot of issues with our application so far. Um, like I mentioned, there's a pretty big um, technological um, gap there. So folks who have, don't have internet access aren't really able to access this program. We've also seen issues with language access. Um, social security numbers are being collected and requested. They're not required, um, but we have a similar fear as someone mentioned earlier that um, this will prevent folks who do not have social security numbers from initiating an application. Um, and we're seeing a lot of issues with the language on the website itself not being you know, plain English. Um, a self-certification or self-attestation form was published on May 14th. Um, it covers housing impact, financial impact, and residency, um, but income, as far as I can tell, is not included on the form. It is quite long. Um, it's also kind of hidden on the website, very far down. It's not embedded in the application itself. So unless you know to look for it, there wouldn't necessarily be a way to access it. Um, it's also a PDF, so folks would have to scan it or print it and scan it and then resubmit it. It's, it's just tricky to use. Um, we haven't seen any data on Stay DC yet. Um, we do know that over 20,000 uh, tenants have initiated applications. Only about half have actually completed and submitted those applications. So the other half are kind of stuck in the document collection process. Um, but we haven't seen any information about approvals, denials, or the spread of applications. We don't know which communities um, are accessing funds or initiating applications. Um, generally, we don't know if um, you know, the folks most vulnerable or heavily impacted by COVID have, you know, been able to access this meaningful relief. Um, we started seeing approvals come out last Monday on May 18th. Um, I think I heard like 500 applications were approved. Um, and we haven't heard anything about direct to tenant assistance being administered quite yet either. Um, so that's the update from DC. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me to participate. Thank you, Emily. You've shared, uh a number of, of uh, somewhat alarming concerns. I'm just curious, is the advocacy community mobilizing to try to influence any of this? Uh, do you have a sense that they're getting through if they are? Uh, any any feedback you can give us about, about that component? Yeah, so there, there has been um, definitely a lot of conversation. So it um, there were two hearings last week uh, regarding kind of uh, sunsetting of our eviction moratorium, which DC does have a very strong eviction moratorium, thankfully. Um, and on, on Friday, there was an 11 and a half hour long hearing where people really honed in on talking about stay DC and the issues that they're seeing. Um, so we heard from advocates, we heard from researchers, we heard from tenants, um, we heard from organizers, people across the board um, really coming together to try to push to get this program improved. And I think we're expecting to see more hearings in front of council in the next couple of weeks. It seems like a huge part of it is just simplifying the process of applying, um, which Treasury has now come out and said, look, you, you know, we strongly encourage you to simplify your, your, your process. Obviously, this question of, of self-certification, which is positive, but then also direct to tenant. Did during these this 11 hour meeting, was there a receptivity to saying, OK, how can we get this done and make make this uh, less onerous for people applying for this assistance? I would say that there was receptivity. Yeah, it's it's a little difficult to gauge because so much of it is up to um, our mayor and our Department of Human Services, Department of um, Housing and Community Development and Deputy Mayor's Office to kind of implement any changes. Um, so it's, I think the council was relatively receptive to hearing our, you know, the, the push and they definitely heard tenants. One of our council members actually um, you know, hosted a, an event the next day where she and a number of community members, um, volunteers got together to assist folks through the state DC application process. So they, you know, a lot of council members are getting this hands-on kind of um, experience with the application itself and really learning about what the weaknesses are, what the boundaries and barriers are to folks receiving assistance. Um, so, I, you know, I would say that there is some receptivity, but um, the, I, I don't know what, what implementation of that will look like um, and how much council will be able to do legislatively to kind of uh, fix the issue. So Jerry Pohe, I don't know if this is more rhetorical or not, but uh, he's a participant on these calls, I think virtually every week. And he says, Emily, is it possible for the DC government to mandate that Deloitte attend all NIC Zoom calls to bring them into the real world? <laughs> I wish. I won't, I, won't, <laughs> I, yeah, I won't make the answer that one. Okay, great. 
Uh, thank you for to Jerry for that comment. Um, I guess there is one more and more question here. Would on the ground registration for the program be better than relying on the digital version, or maybe as as an option? You know, maybe to do some outreach with on the ground registration. Uh, I don't know if that came up during the during the meeting you were describing. Yeah, there's definitely been a push for more community outreach. Um, I know in best practice is one thing that's really highlighted and um, I attended a, a National Income Housing Coalition call a few weeks ago where, um, you know, council member from San Antonio and the mayor from Oakland were talking about the importance of partnering with community organizations. And so that's definitely been a part of our conversation is like, how do we reach folks on the ground who um, need this assistance the most? How do we work with you know, partners that the community trusts in order to ensure that they're receiving good information um, and getting the technical assistance that they need. But I do think on the ground um, and paper applications would be really, will be really important in terms of, you know, making sure that folks who are most vulnerable are receiving this assistance. Great. Thank you so much, Emily, for that report and for your good work. We, uh, we hope that they, they take to heart the recommendations that, that you're making and and frankly, time is of the essence because there is a September deadline for uh, getting out a significant portion of, of these resources. So thank you very much, Emily, appreciate it. Okay, we will go on now to our next uh, field update. And that is with Nick Thompson, uh, who is statewide initiatives manager at Texas Homeless Network. Nick, take it away. Hi everybody. Um, if we haven't met virtually before, my name is Nick Thompson, and like Paul said, I am the statewide initiatives manager for Texas Homeless Network. I'm just getting over a cold, so I hope that you can um, understand me perfectly clear. So I co-direct our, our state and federal advocacy efforts. I'm actually here today to mostly talk about something that's been going on locally. So here in the city of Austin, where I live and where THN's office is located, um, we just held a May municipal election, which included this proposition called Proposition B. Um, and in Proposition B, it recriminalizes three uh, key activities. So from sitting and lying, public camping, and panhandling um, in key places. So that includes our downtown district and the immediate area around the University of Texas at Austin. Um, unfortunately, that proposition did pass 58 to 42 in that local election. There were loads of misinformation and money coming into uh, pro proposition B efforts. So I think they raised ultimately about $2 million on a municipal campaign versus the 200,000 that that local groups against Prop B, namely Homes Not Handcuffs, was able to um, fundraise in those efforts. So very generally speaking, um, richer, wider areas of Austin voted to reinstate the ban and poorer, more racially diverse uh, neighborhoods, where I will also say some of the largest camps are voted against the ban. So that is a pattern that we've seen here in Austin and across the country as well. Um, so a little bit of a picture of homelessness here in Austin. So we have 3,160 people who are experiencing homelessness in Austin in 2021. And roughly two thirds of these folks are unsheltered. So the remaining 922 people um, who are experiencing homelessness in Austin are in traditional shelters or hotels acquired by the city uh, during COVID-19. Um, homelessness in Austin continues to have a disparate impact, particularly on black Austinites. So black people make up 37% of people experiencing homelessness here in Austin, but only 8% of our county's population. So where we stand right now is that the city council is debating sites for city sanctioned camps across all city council districts, uh, which is receiving a lot of backlash. And they are also continuing to work on a previously existing plan to house 3000 people experiencing homelessness in the next three years. Um, unfortunately, the state government saw what was going on in Austin and decided to double down on these efforts as well with House Bill 1925. Um, so our Texas legislative session is in its final days. It ends a week from today. Um, and unfortunately, I am expecting HB 1925 to be signed into law in the following days. Um, this bill would also preempt cities from using public parks as potential sanctioned homeless campsites as well. So in terms of advocacy, if you live in Texas, always call your state house rep. The bill has to go back to the house because um, the Senate added some amendments to that. And, you know, as Texas Homeless Network, we are not super involved with 
what is happening locally. And so I, I would be remiss not to mention the very hard work. So the very hard work of our partners on the local level, uh, Texas Appleseed and the Community Homeless Coalition or ECHO, who is the COC uh, lead for Austin Travis County, the other ones foundation and other local organizations. So the reason we're sp speaking about this today is this is obviously not a great pattern that we're seeing here in the second most populous state in the country. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions that y'all might have. Thank you, uh, Nick. That's um, disconcerting to hear uh, that this is going on in what is considered to be one of the more progressive parts of, of Texas. Um, I don't see any questions at the moment. Uh, it's possible that some more will come in. If you have a moment to, if you could stay on for a couple of minutes, just kind of keep your eye on the, the Q&A box or the chat box. That would be really helpful. Uh, but we we do have a comment from, from Jerry, who I mentioned before, saying just thank you for your fearlessness in the fa face of uh, hateful actions. We're with you. So thank you very, very much, Nick. Appreciate it. Thank you, Paul. Okay. Okay, now we'll move on to our next uh, field present uh, presentation, and that's Evan uh, Romanoff, uh, Assistant Attorney General of uh, the Office of the Minnesota Attorney General. Evan, take it away. Hi, everyone. Thank you. Uh, my name is Evan Romanoff. I'm an Assistant Attorney General at the Minnesota AG's office, as you can see here. Um, I am in the Consumer Wage and Antitrust Division. But last spring, I was assigned to a team that enforces uh, Governor Walz's eviction moratorium and, and lease termination moratorium. And we've got a team of other AAGs and staff working on this issue. Um, next slide, please. So back in March of last year, so March 2020, about almost exactly 14 months ago, Governor Walz announced a peacetime emergency in Minnesota, obviously in response to the pandemic. Um, and the eviction moratorium that was put in place uh, shortly thereafter is key to the, the peacetime emergency as far as timing goes. So the eviction moratorium remains in effect until either the emergency is terminated or, or it's otherwise rescinded by proper authority. Um, and every month since March of 2020, the eviction moratorium, pardon me, the peacetime emergency has been extended. So for over a year now, it's been in place. It's gone through, as you can see here, three different iterations since it started uh, back in March 2020. The most recent one, EO 20-79, has been in effect since August uh, 4th of last year. Uh, so what does it do? Generally speaking, it, it protects residential tenants from evictions or lease terminations, or uh, importantly, notices of non-renewal during the pendency of the emergency. Um, obviously, it's designed to facilitate public health and safety, keep tenants sheltered, uh, and, and make sure that they can't be forced out of their home, you know, for, for various reasons, including non-payment, lease, minor lease violations, things like that. There are exceptions in place, uh, including where the tenant that, that would permit a landlord to either file an eviction action or terminate a tenancy, and, and those are uh, pretty narrowly restricted to situations where the tenant has seriously endangered others, uh, where they violated certain criminal statutes in Minnesota, uh, where they've significantly damaged property. Um, and then there's another exception that's, that's kind of nuanced, but essentially says that if the landlord or the property owner has a, uh, a family member or they themselves need to move into the property, they can uh, terminate the lease or issue a notice of non-renewal. And we've seen quite a fair amount of abuse of that here in Minnesota by landlords kind of using that as a loophole and claiming a need where none really exists. Um, otherwise, there's it also a per, the, the executive order also permits uh, sheriff's deputies in Minnesota who hold uh, writs of recovery of premises, so court orders that are issued by a court after an eviction action has been uh, after an eviction has been granted, it prohibits them from executing those writs uh, in, unless certain conditions apply. There's other kind of nuance to the order that that I don't think we have time really or uh, to, to get into here. Um, you know, there's a notice requirement, um, things like that. It, it has been upheld, I'll, I'll note, as constitutional here in Minnesota by a federal district court. I believe that case is currently on appeal, but I don't expect that to be overturned. Um, next slide, please. So our enforcement authority, uh, the AGO, uh, is, is explicit. We've been provided with authority to enforce the order 
under our statutory enforcement scheme. Um, and we can seek for violations of the order, we can seek restitution, civil penalties, injunctive relief, um, and other sorts of, any other sort of relief we're, we're typically allowed to seek in uh, consumer cases. Um, a bit about our process, we've, as of about an hour ago, I last checked, we're at 3,017 complaints from tenants. Uh, so the, the way it basically works is tenants are encouraged to fill out a complaint form on our website, which I've linked to there, uh, and, and get in touch with us via that, that mechanism and, and explain what's going on. Um, there's also a, a you know, hotline they can call. We have a fully staffed phone room, uh, but the best way is online and it's most efficient. Um, and we investigate every single complaint. We, we, our typical process is to contact the tenant, gather additional information to figure out, uh, inform them of the executive order and figure out if there has in fact been a violation. If, if not, we'll usually refer them to appropriate agencies if they have other things going on. Um, and, and we can assist them with other things. If there is a violation, however, we make sure that they consent to us contacting their landlord. And then we, we get in touch with the landlord to inform them also of the executive order. I mean, oftentimes, at least it was the case early on in this process, about a year ago, lots of landlords weren't even aware of the executive order, uh, but we attempt to resolve the issue uh, with the landlord in that process. I mean, our, our goal is always try to get voluntary compliance from landlords. Um, you know, as I said, sometimes they're not aware. Uh, and when we explain the executive order to them, almost always they are willing to, they, they agree to comply with it once we inform them essentially that they have to. Uh, however, you know, where that's not the case, we, we have authority under the executive order to sue them and we've, we've done so. We've filed eight enforcement actions so far under the executive order. Uh, we've obtained court orders, TROs, uh, requiring landlords to, to immediately cease certain conduct or, um, you know, repair electricity or utilities or, or, uh, inst you know, let tenants back in if they've, if they've executed an illegal lockout or things like that. And we've settled uh, seven of those eight cases now successfully. There's one that's ongoing, was actually the first one we filed over a year ago now. It uh, looks like it's maybe heading toward trial. Um, that's pretty much everything I have prepared. I mean, we're still working through what, what we think is gonna happen once the executive order is lifted. There's likely gonna be a flood of evictions if, if it's just rescinded uh, or if the peacetime emergency just expires with, with no other uh, nothing else in place. So hopefully, you know, we're hopeful that the, the legislature here in Minnesota is going to institute some kind of negotiated off ramp to uh, give, you know, tenants who are perhaps behind on rent an ability to cure that before they, they face an eviction action. Um, but that's all I have. If anyone has any questions, happy to happy to stick around and answer. them. Fantastic, Evan. Uh, such such important work. Thank you very much for that presentation and for everything that you're you're doing related to it. Uh, one question that I have is: uh, Do you have any sense? Is there are there any clues to when the uh, the peacetime emergency and the eviction uh, moratorium executive order will stay in place, or when it might be lifted? Yeah, so I don't really have any insider info in the governor, you know, as far as what's coming out of the governor's office, it's it's his decision. Um, I think, you know, we've sort of dialed back certain protections here in Minnesota. I think the mask mandate has, has been lifted statewide, uh, at least, and cities can still institute their own. But, you know, there's been comments as, as vaccination rates improve, there's been comments from the governor about hopefully lifting additional restrictions probably into July. I don't know whether that means in July, I don't know whether that means lifting the peacetime emergency in its entirety or just removing other orders that might be in effect. I mean, there's my office is involved in, in enforcing other orders as well. There's a price gouging executive order, which actually also relates to rental housing. We were heavily involved in, in orders earlier this winter uh, enforcing certain COVID-19 restrictions in, in bars and restaurants. We had to sue a bunch of them that were sort of had lack of social distancing or were opening when they weren't supposed to. Uh, so that's a long way of saying, sorry, no, I don't, I don't have any inside info. Um, I think it'll also depend on what the legislature legislature is able to get done here. If they're able to negotiate some sort of off ramp, uh, then I think it's more likely governor walls will be, will, will, will you know, lift the emergency sooner. And at this time, um, when you're reaching out to landlords, and you, as you said, especially early on, they, they may not have even been aware of, of the executive order, 
But are you also now able to say, and, you know, not only can you not evict, but there are now resources available to you. The emergency rental assistance is beginning to flow. Make sure you apply for that. Get your renters uh, involved in that. Are you able to make that pitch as well? Oh, yeah. We, we tell every tenant we speak with who's behind on rent, as well as the landlords, about the emergency rental assistance programs in place. And there was one earlier this year, and now there's obviously the new one. I mean, we've heard a lot of frustrations about ease of access. I think other of your panelists have spoken to um, or, you know, delays in, in getting the funds available. But yeah, we, we let them know that, you know, you can't evict right now for non-payment of rent. Here, here's a link you should encourage your tenant to apply. And we tell the same thing for the tenants, the executive order. It doesn't, you know, a lot of people think it suspends rent payments. It, it doesn't. So when it's lifted, those are going to be due and owing. Um, so we encourage everyone to, to apply. And the last question I'll, I'll just share with you here is, uh, again from Jerry, is the AG resource to meet all the requests and how, how likely is money and staffing support throughout the pandemic um, need and beyond is what he stated here, right? you know, is it gonna make, is it gonna be able to meet the need and beyond? Yeah, I mean, we have so far, it's been a year plus uh, and, We've been resourced sufficiently. I mean, Keith Ellison has announced housing as a priority of his. Um, so he's devoted uh, staff to this issue. And we've had a lot of a lot of great volunteers. I mean, not just from my division, but from others who, you know, nominally shouldn't really be doing this kind of work, but represent boards and agencies. They've agreed to volunteer to, to help with our enforcement work here. Um, you know, I guess question of resources, we're not resourced to sue out every single violation likely, which is maybe one reason that we attempt to secure voluntary compliance first. Um, but like I said, you know, we've received over 3000 complaints of violation. We've, we've only had to file eight lawsuits. And I think maybe we, you know, we might hear a, a criticism that we don't, we don't, uh, we maybe aren't as aggressive enough, but I think we do, we do what we can. Uh, as, as far as beyond goes, I guess I'm not sure what exactly that means beyond the pandemic, what sort of resources we'll have to devote to this. I don't know if we'll have, the AG will have a role in um, whatever wind down or, or negotiated off ramp the legislature comes up with. I'm not, I'm just not sure. Great, Evan, thank you again so much for your work and, and for this presentation. So very, very valuable, really appreciate all you're doing and, and for you updating us on, on that work. So thanks. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. All right, take care. Yep, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay, we will move on now and bring back um, the, the ever popular Kim Johnson, policy analyst from the National Low Income Housing Coalition to talk to us about uh, the latest from Capitol Hill, what, how things are moving or not moving and uh, just provide some updates and next steps. Kim? Wow, thanks again, Paul. Um, and I will request that everyone introduce me as the ever popular Kim Johnson from now on. Um, so thank you for you know, bringing me back. Um, in addition to the updates on fiscal recovery funds, I am doing my best impression of our VP of Policy, Sarah, today to bring you the latest updates from Capitol Hill. So after a strong start, bipartisan negotiations between the Biden administration and congressional Republicans over the president's $2.3 trillion infrastructure proposal have slowed. There are three main sticking points to negotiations. First, what constitutes infrastructure? Second, how much to spend on infrastructure? And third, how to pay for infrastructure spending? The White House released on May 21st a $1.7 trillion counteroffer to Senate Republicans' earlier $568 billion proposal. Um, this counteroffer slashed investments in broadband, roads and bridges, and research and development to bring the bill's costs to a number that Republicans could find more palatable. But the proposal maintained tax increases on corporations and the wealthiest Americans to help pay for the cost of the investments, which Senate Major Minority Leader rather Mitch McConnell um, called a non-starter. While the White House remains hopeful a bipartisan agreement can be reached, lawmakers are running up against a soft deadline to make some progress on a potential, potential bipartisan bill by Memorial Day. NLIHC is working to ensure that Congress includes in any infrastructure spending plan comprehensive resources to achieve housing justice, including our priorities from the housing campaign. So that's an expansion of rental assistance to every eligible household, 
$70 billion to repair public housing and make energy efficient upgrades to existing public housing stock, and at least $40 billion annually for the National Housing Trust Fund to build and preserve homes affordable to people with the lowest incomes. You can take action by signing your organization onto a national letter urging Congress to support these robust investments. And I see that Paul already dropped the letter into the chat again. Great job. Thanks, Paul. Um, so in addition to that update about the infrastructure package, I also wanted to note that we're expecting the president to release his budget request for fiscal year 2022 this Friday. This is the first time in a decade congressional appropriators are not under the constraints of uh, on discretionary spending imposed by the Budget Control Act. And so in President Biden's budget blueprint that was released last month, HUD programs received a $9 billion or 15% increase from FY21 appropriated levels, which was amazing. And we expect that to be in the full budget request as well. And while president, the president's budget request has little bearing on how appropriators ultimately decide to divvy up federal funding, it does signal the administration's priorities and mark the official kickoff of this year's appropriations process. House appropriators are planning markups in June and July with the goal of passing all 12 spending bills before the August recess. No word yet on when the Senate is planning on their markups, um, but we will be sure to keep everybody posted. And so thanks as always to all of you for joining us. And with that, I will hand it back over to you, Paul. Great, Kim, thank you. Um, let's see, uh, Jerry, who is our, always our, one of our most active participants asked, uh, many are concerned that our Republican legislators are not serious partners in the process. How could we reveal the seriousness or lack thereof by the minority? Hmm. How can we reveal? I mean, it always helps to continue to pressure your elected officials to include these resources in um, any infrastructure package that moves forward to sit down in good faith with negotiate with um, uh, you know their counterparts to work out these negotiations. Um, but ultimately, um, the path forward on a bipartisan plan is kind of fundamentally unclear um, and very much, um, I guess, up in the air. So I think that it helps, like I said, to keep the pressure on for them to do the right thing while also understanding that if that doesn't pan out, we have other options like Senator Hirono was talking about earlier with um, passing a bill through reconciliation as well. So there's another question I will answer, um, and that is, uh, is this the same sign-on letter from a couple of weeks ago, or is this a new sign-on letter? In other words, should we be signing on again, even if we signed on a few weeks ago? So what I would just say is you should look at the link that we shared, the second link that I just shared, to find your organization. The reason I say that is, is yes, we had this letter being circulated a few weeks ago, but we had several other uh, letters going out at the same time. If you'll recall, there was the um, you know, eviction moratorium letter. There was the, the federal budget and appropriations letter. We just wanna make sure that you don't think, oh, we, we must have signed that a couple of weeks ago when you signed one of the other letters. So please go on to um, the second link that I shared and I'll list them by state. So it's really easy to find your organization. We really want to make sure that we get as many organizations signed on to this letter as possible. Um, so that's my, my advice there. And um, I do want to just say thank you to Kim again for being so popular and being so efficient and, and thorough in your presentation. Uh, thank you so much. I will just say that, you know, in terms of the next steps, what we need you all to do. Uh, of course, sign that letter. We want to really grow the number of signatures on there before we again uh, send it up to Congress. Um, in addition, I just want to encourage everybody, if you are not currently participating in one of our working group calls, we do get down into the nitty gritty a little bit more uh, with a legislative policy working group that takes place on Tuesdays at 1230. We have a disaster housing recovery working group that happens on Tuesdays at three. And we have a working group on 
state and local implementation, particularly now focused on implementation of the uh, emergency rental assistance programs. Those are on Wednesdays at three. And then the first Monday of every month, there's a special working group with uh, residents and resident leaders, renters and others called Tenant Talk Live. Um, we encourage you to participate in that. I'm gonna <laughs> put in the chat a place where you can register for all of those working group calls, including Tenant Talk Live. So please join those if, if you are interested in getting into a little bit more detail uh, with a smaller group to kind of discuss actions and so forth. So um, I think that pretty much concludes our uh, call today. I just, again, wanna thank everyone on the call for your participation, your excellent questions, uh, your sharing of resources, and I especially want to thank all of our panelists for their excellent presentations and responses to questions. Um, so we'll see you uh, next week and uh, be healthy, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Take care.